Welcome to Tax Law GH and welcome to our video on international taxation. Perhaps one of the most interesting, if not the most interesting area of taxation. In this series of videos, we will begin by looking at the concept of international double taxation or what some people refer to simply as double taxation. Then we begin to look at different areas of international tax law vis-a-vis -vis local tax law and what you really need to know when it comes to this area of tax. So let's start. What is international double taxation? Or to even say simply, when we say double taxation, what does it mean? Many people use this term around. They said, isn't this double taxation? Or what is double taxation? Doesn't that um, imply there is some double taxation? So what is double taxation? At a very simple fundamental level, let's say for the purpose of our discussion today, that double taxation is fundamentally the imposition of tax on the same income by multiple jurisdictions. Very fundamental level. The imposition of tax on the same income by multiple jurisdictions or multiple countries or multiple territories. So that will be our working definition of double taxation. Now take note that primarily there are two main forms of double taxation. It's either it's going to be economic double taxation or what some people call juridical double taxation. So take note, economic and juridical. What is the key difference between these two forms of double taxation and what do you need to know when it comes to these two forms of double taxation? Under economic double taxation, what we are saying is the taxation, or this is the taxation of the same income in the hands of different taxpayers by multiple jurisdictions. I'll take that again. It's a taxation of the same income in the hands of different taxpayers by multiple jurisdictions. So essentially, it's the imposition of comparable taxes in two or more states on different taxpayers in respect of the same subject matter. So here, the distinguishing factor is that for economic double taxation, we are taxing the same income. However, it's in the hands of different taxpayers, not the same person. Let's come to juridical double taxation. Let's draw where the difference lies. So we are saying that the juridical double taxation, this is the taxation of the same income in the hands of the same taxpayer, this time around by multiple jurisdictions. So essentially, this is the imposition of comparable taxes in two or more states on the same taxpayer in respect of the same subject matter and for identical periods. So the more common, or can we establish that the more common form of double taxation would be the juridical double taxation. For example, you go to um, Germany to work, you earn money there, Germany will tax you. You bring that money to Ghana and GRI wants to tax you on that same money. This is juridical because it is in respect to you, the same taxpayer, one person, same income you earn in Germany, Germany wants to tax you. You brought that income to Ghana. Ghana wants to tax you. So remember, juridical is taxation of the same income in the hands of the same taxpayer. Economic, however, will not have been in your hands. So let's say economic double taxation, very simplistic example. It can get complicated, but very simplistic example is, let's say you earn the income in Germany. You transfer that income to someone else either by way of a different um, entity or vehicle type so let's say you use the form of um, a subsidiary per se sim simple example when you transfer that money from parent to subsidiary in another territory this time around you can see the income is not being taxed in the hands of the same company so maybe a german company transfers money to a different company then they want to tax that um, income amount in the hands of the different subsidiary so the key takeaway point from here is that when it comes to double taxation, we have two forms, economic and juridical. The more common form or the most common form will be the juridical double taxation, where we are taxing the same income in the hands of the same taxpayer. So remember, key distinguishing factor in economic double taxation, we are taxing the same income, but however, it's in the hands of different taxpayers by different countries. So key point is in the hands of different taxpayers. However, juridical double taxation is the same income in the hands of the same person, one person, 
by different countries. So remember this. And we are saying that methods for relieving international double taxation I primarily focus on juridical double taxation. So as I'll show you shortly, the whole purpose of most of the double taxation agreements and the reliefs granted by these double taxation agreements are focused on juridical double taxation. So when you hear double taxation, what most people refer to fundamentally is the juridical double taxation. But don't forget that there is economic it is not as common as juridical, but it really, really does exist. So when it comes to the areas of um, transfer pricing, there will be some relevance on when it comes to um, economic double tax. So for now, just know that juridical is a more common one and a lot of the double taxation reliefs offered by double taxation agreements mainly focus on eliminating or reducing the incidence of juridical double taxation. Now that we know the forms, let's look at what will give rise to juridical double taxation or what are the sources what are the things that will lead to juridical double taxation i'm saying here that juridical double taxation may occur in one of three scenarios these are the common ones so it's either something we call a source source conflict a residence residence conflict or a residence source conflict i'll explain each of these shortly but just know that it's either going to be source source residence residence or residence source if you ever forget just know that your two main operative words are source and residence. So in combination number one, you pick source when you multiply it by two, so it becomes source source. In combination number two, you pick residence and you multiply by two, it becomes residence residence. Then your third combination, just add the two words together to become residence source. So now that we know that it's either going to be source source, residence residence or residence source, Let's explain each one in, in turn and let's see how these different conflicts or these different sources of juridical double taxation will give rise to the incidence or the occurrence of double taxation. So let's start with source source. We are saying that the source source, this is where two countries assert the right to tax the same income of a taxpayer because they both claim that the income is sourced in their country. So this conflict arises where, let's say, Ghana is claiming that this income of this taxpayer has a source in Ghana. Germany is also saying that under the German income tax laws, this income is sourced in Germany. So Germany wants to tax it because they deem it to be ha having a source in Germany. Ghana is also deeming it to tax or deeming to tax this amount because according to the Ghana Revenue Authority, this amount has a source in Ghana. So because the, there's a source conflict, Ghana is claiming the source is in Ghana. Germany is claiming the sources in Germany. We call this a source-source conflict. Because of this, it will give rise to a juridical double taxation scenario where both territories, remember, I said juridical will be what? Taxing the income in the hands of what? The same taxpayer, but in different countries. So juridical double taxation, source number one is what? Source-source conflict, where two countries claim that the income is sourced from their country. So they both want to tax the income. That is a source source conflict. Let's look at residence residence conflict. This is actually very, very, very common. So this is where two countries assert the right to tax the same income of a taxpayer because they both claim that the taxpayer is a resident of their country, which we'll call a dual resident taxpayer. As I'll show you shortly, um, there can be residence conflicts and there's a way to resolve those conflicts. I'll teach you all of that shortly. So in residence residence, this is not about sourcing or whether the income has a source in that country. Here, both countries are claiming that the person or the taxpayer is a tax resident person in their territory. So they want their tax, they want to collect their tax revenue. So here, if you know the general principle in international tax law is that when it comes to residents, usually a resident person or those states that operate something we call the worldwide tax system like Ghana does, if you are resident, all things being equal, ordinarily, we are going to tax you on your worldwide income forever end. So being deemed resident is a big deal when it comes to tax. So imagine country A deems you, let's use, um, let's change the country. So let's say Ghana and then UK. So let's say Ghana claims you are tax resident. UK claims you are tax resident. And they both want to tax you on the same income. Because the residence rules require you to have a higher level of tax, or higher level of tax connection to the country, this also leads towards an incidence of double taxation because both of them want to tax you and it will lead to juridical double taxation. So the second scenario is what residence residence. And you might wonder how can I be resident in both? This is very common. 
as i'll show you shortly for example under Ghana's rules anybody who spends more than 183 days in aggregate over a 12-month period will be deemed tax resident in ghana however if that same person is a citizen and he doesn't spend more than 365 continuous days outside ghana they are still resident so imagine you're a citizen you go to the uk you spend 183 days the uk's rules also say that if you stay in uk for more than 183 days you are uk resident so imagine you're a citizen you went for a holiday in the uk you stayed there for seven months seven months you'd have exceeded 183 days uk is claiming you are a resident but according to ghana because you're a citizen and you've not stayed outside ghana for more than 365 continuous days you are still being deemed resident in ghana so this is a clear example of a ghanaian citizen going to uk for seven months earning income in the uk that scenario all things being equal taking aside all the um, intricacies and complexities such a scenario leads to a ghanaian citizen being deemed as resident in ghana resident in uk and that's a classic example of what residence residence conflict let's look at the residence source conflict as the name implies this is where one country asserts their right to tax foreign source income of a taxpayer because a taxpayer is a resident of that country and then the other other country will assert their right to tax the same income because the income arises or has its source in that country so here as the name implies let's use I've used Ghana, Germany, I've used Ghana, UK. Let's use um, Ghana and South Africa. So let's say this time around, Ghana is claiming that you are resident in Ghana, so they want to tax you. South Africa is claiming that the income that they want to tax you on has its source in South Africa, so they also want to collect their tax. So here, one person is claiming the income to have a source in that country. The other is claiming that the person who has the income is resident in that country. So there'll be a conflict and it will lead towards international double taxation international juridical double taxation so because of these conflicts that is why we had to bring something called double taxation agreements double taxation agreements are meant to reduce or to eliminate double taxation as you can see we have three three sources of three conflicts source source residence residence or residence source now because of these three scenarios if we don't have a mechanism that will eliminate this situation it will lead to a, um, a scenario where people will not be willing to what trade across borders it will stifle international trade i mean it will not make life easy because people move around we're in a globalized um, world the world is becoming increasingly um, connected so we had to have double taxation agreement or double taxation treaties at this point let me emphasize that this video in as much as it will cover every single fundamental concept of international tax will not be a full course on international tax as you may be aware anyone sitting the chartered institute of taxation ghana exam has a paper to write called international taxation it's a whole course on international tax meaning that international tax is a whole area of study subsequently in our series we'll cover into details those concepts so we even go back to the background of double taxation treaties, the very first one that was signed, how treaties have evolved over the years onto the current 2017 OECD model tax convention we have and all of that. We look at the BEPS project and all of that. But for now, just know that this is introducing you to everything you need to know about international tax, but there'll be a more advanced um, um, series for those who are looking to learn the advanced, more complicated, more complex areas for um, purpose of being a chartered tax practitioner. So let's continue. Let's come back to the objectives of double taxation agreements or treaties. Why, um, why, why are they signed? What are the objectives? What do they seek to do? So we are saying that first thing they seek to do is to eliminate the most common forms of juridical and economic double taxation. Remember I said most um, reliefs will focus on juridical, but economic double taxation is not left out. To a large extent, DTAs. So when I say DTA, I mean double taxation agreement. When I say DTT, I mean double taxation treaty. So anytime you hear me say DTA, DTT, don't be confused. It's double taxation agreement or double taxation treaty. But I prefer to use DTA a lot of times. So let's make it simple. Most DTAs are signed, number one, to eliminate the most common forms of juridical and economic double taxation because this form of double taxation exists there must be a way to eliminate so two countries come together to sign what we call a bilateral dta bilateral meaning is between two people or two countries there's also the emergence recently of something called multilateral dtas 
where more than two countries come together and they sign DTA to um, aid the prevention of double taxation within those number of signatory countries. But for now, let's focus on the bilateral DTAs. And we are saying that this one purpose is to eliminate the most common forms of juridical and economic double taxation. Second purpose is to eliminate some forms of tax discrimination. Increasingly, new DTAs that are being signed are having provisions around tax discrimination, where the provision is that nobody will be discriminated against unfairly just by virtue of being um, a resident of another, another contracting state. So basically, to so ensure that Every, every member of a contracting state that is a party to a DTA will not be discriminated against unfairly when it comes to taxes. So it's to ensure fairness for all persons who are um, resident or signatories to a DTA. The next objective or purpose of a DTA is to provide a standardized set of rules for dividing tax revenues between countries. Now, what you may not know and why I'm using the term dividing tax revenues here is that double taxation agreements do not impose new taxes. So you see a DTA imposing a tax that does not already exist. Like I said, I will delve into the principles of international tax law in the very complex videos. But for now, just know that when it comes to DTAs, what they do is they allocate something we call taxing rights. So for example, if you take the Ghana UK DTA, or the Ghana United Kingdom DTT. All it does is it, it says that for this particular income item, Ghana has the right to tax it. For this particular income, let's give UK the right to tax it. It does allocation, it doesn't impose. So you'll find a DTA saying that we are imposing a new tax of 17.5% or we're imposing a new tax of 25%. DTAs do not impose new taxes. They allocate taxing rights to the contracting states that are party to the DTA. So here we are saying that here, DTAs will provide some form of standardized set of rules for dividing tax revenues or allocating tax revenue between countries. So it will help us know, okay, country A will take this one or country B will take this one. So you find DTAs using the terms the source state or the resident state should get this income or this tax amount. So just know that DTAs have a standardized set of rules for allocating or dividing tax revenues between countries. The next is to address tax evasion and avoidance. You can see they are not saying it's going to prevent or eliminate. It's going to address or reduce the incidence or the occurrence of tax evasion and avoidance. As you know, and we've learned in um, our video on tax planning, if you haven't watched, do check it out. We said in tax planning video that tax evasion is illegal, but tax avoidance is all, to a large extent, very legal unless you over tax avoid. So in as much as double taxation agreements seek to prevent double taxation they also are there to ensure that we do not have something called double non-taxation double non-taxation being that there is a risk that if we are looking at dts too much we may end up not taxing the income at all as in the person doesn't pay tax in either country a or country b so these dts are there to also prevent or address tax evasion and avoidance and to also prevent the case of double non-taxation Right. The next is it's, it's there to provide a framework for settling tax dispute. So there is a provision in every DTA covering something called um, dispute resolution, or some people call mutual agreement procedures. And um, this will ensure that there's a, a framework in, in place. If there is a dispute between, let's say, the Ghana Revenue Authority and the UK's HMRC, how will these two bodies settle any tax disputes that arise? Or let's say Ghana, Ghana's um, Ghana Revenue Authority and South Africa's SAS or South African Revenue Service, how will GRA and SARS resolve any dispute? Or let's say Nigeria's FIRS, the Federal Inland Revenue Service of Nigeria, and let's say um, KRA, so Kenya Revenue Authority, how will FIRS of Nigeria and KRA resolve any disputes they may have. So DTAs give us a framework for settling tax disputes. Another purpose of DTAs is to provide a stable tax environment to foreign investors. Now, to be honest, if you are not aware, there are many investors who look at double taxation agreements or the existence of DTAs before they invest in certain countries. So some somebody may invest in Ghana if they are in a UK resident company just because Ghana and UK has a DTA. So it will be a motivating factor because DTAs, as I'll show you shortly, also provide for lower rates under certain conditions. So you want to 
invest in a particular country just because your home country and that country have a DT, so it will encourage you to trade and then obviously you pay less taxes and you even if not for, not for paying less taxes you don't pay tax twice right you don't go into the scenario of um juridical double taxation the next is it increases international competitiveness of the economy right and it facilitates foreign investment international trade and the transfer of technology so as the world is getting more globalized countries will seek to do business or to trade with each other dtas are there to encourage this type of trade so we are having we are seeing um agreements such as the africa continental free trade area agreement and all of that everyone is excited but these ones are there to what um ensure that trade flows freely so ultimately we are looking to have some form of um customs or import duty exemptions but it doesn't eliminate income taxation um across board it will cover the trade taxes but how about income tax so dta's are there to facilitate international trade if the rates are lower they will not tax you on your income twice across two countries you'll be more motivated to transfer technology transfer knowledge trade across that country have fdi inflow and all of that so that's one other purpose of dta's the next is that dta's also are relevant to the decision of whether or not to enter into a tax treaty or amend an existing one so um based on the existence of a dta you can also use as the basis to amend or negotiate a different one so on the left i've summarized in a three-step approach basically we are saying that the first if you have to summarize everything we said so far is eliminate double taxation and prevent tax avoidance and evasion so eliminate double taxation and prevents tax avoidance and evasion then it flows down to removing tax obstacles and distortions to cross-border trade and investment flows and then it flows down to maximizing global wealth by ensuring an efficient allocation of resources so these are the purposes or the objectives of double taxation agreements or treaties now let's look at what are the models available obviously no country can just get up and say i'm signing a double tax agreement on their own there are guides there are models there are things to look at and copy from and use that to draft your agreement so we are saying states are free or they are at liberty to structure their dtas in ways that best captures their mutual interest so you can say i want to use this type or this model to capture my interest there are quite a number out there but the most common ones the most popular ones the, mo the most in use ones are three the first is the oecd model tax convention on income and capital so oecd is an organization of um, organization on economic cooperation and development the oecd model tax convention was primarily developed for developed nations or oecd member countries but non-oecd member countries are adopting it anyways it's the most popular um, by far um, it's it's more authoritative in terms of guidance in terms of um, power in the international tax space there's a there are a lot more references to the oecd model tax convention on income and capital so on the far right you can see at the top that's how it looks like um, the latest version as i speak today is the 2017 oecd model tax convention it's available online for free you can just check it out um, i'll cover some of the articles in advance international tax videos anyways but just know that the first one or the first type is the oecd model tax convention the next type is the united nations or the un model double tax convention between developed and developing countries so as you can see the name it suggests that this is more tailored towards the needs of developing countries like ghana so the un model actually when i compare the two there's a lot of similar provisions they have a lot of similar and provisions between the OECD and the UN one just minor variations here and there but they are not 100% exact there are differences between the two just that the UN was couched or framed for developing countries like countries in South Saharan Africa and then there's a US model income tax convention it's not as widely used as the OECD and the UN one it's actually among the three is the least common but it, it also exists so just know that these are models when two countries want to sign a double task agreement between themselves, they can pick between either the OECD, the UN, or the US model. They pick that model, it gives them a framework, then they insert their country names into the dash. So there's a dash for you to put your country name there. You can tweak the rates to what you want. You can change some terms here and there. But some articles are standards. So when you pick the DTA, it's broken down into articles. So for example, article 4 of every DTA, at least the OECD and the UN, 
deals with residence. Article 5, for instance, will deal with permanent establishment. So there are basic rules. You pick those and then what you adjust to suit your unique or your specific needs. Now that we know the three types, what are the articles of a DTA? So this is the OECD um, 2017 Model Tax Convention. You can see it has roughly um, 32 model um, articles that countries can pick from. So remember I, I spoke to you about non-discrimination or to prevent what tax discrimination. So if you can see on the right, Article 24 deals with non-discrimination. I spoke about dispute resolution mechanism. You can see Article 25 deals with something called mutual agreement procedure. That's for tax authorities to what, agree their dispute. I spoke about elimination of double tax agreement and double tax double taxation. If you see Article 23 A and B deal with exemption method and credit method, these are ways of eliminating double tax. I spoke about Article 4 on resident on the left, Article 5 permanent establishment. You can see there's Article 7 on business profit, Article 11 on interest, Article 10 on dividends. So this is a model. You pick this, it has standard terms, then as a country or as two countries wanting to sign a DTA, you are mandated to suit your unique needs. But the OECD Model Tax Convention, as you can see here, this is the most authoritative, like I said, and this is how it looks like. What else should you know when it comes to um, double taxation agreements? Let me show you one um, impact, or let's call it double tax agreements in action. So why why should we sign double tax agreements? And like I was saying, for example, let me give you a typical scenario. You must be aware that when you are paying dividends, obviously, if you've watched our um, withholding tax video series, you realize that when it comes to withholding tax, when you make payments to a non-resident person for dividend, what do you withhold at? At a rate of what? 8%. Now, if you look at this table, this is a sample. That's, that's a longer table. I just took a sample to show you. For example, if you look at um, Germany, if you look up there, it's saying dividends where the recipient holds at least 10% or 25% of the shares, depending on the DTA, the rate is as low as 5%. So it means that if you were not paying to Germany or South Africa or any other country that Ghana has a DTA with, you would have withheld at 8%, which is high. But because of the DTA with Germany and South Africa, you pay lower at 5%. So you can see that here in this case, even a DTA is allocating what a lower rate. And the laws allow you, or international tax law gives the liberty to choose the lower rate. So if your local rate or your domestic rate is lower, I can choose that. If the DTA rate is lower, I can choose that. Let's look at another example. Um, on the far right, on the last but one, you can see technical or management service fee. Now under that, you can see that, let's say France is 10%, UK is 10%. If it wasn't to France or UK, the domestic rate would have been to withhold to a non-resident person at 20%. So you can see this is almost a 10% saving just because you are paying towards a country that has a DTA with Ghana. So DTA is in action. The point here is this is not comprehensive, but to show you that the DTAs provide low rates in a number of situations and these low rates will apply when you are dealing with that DTA country. So this is one benefit, like I said, people look at something like this to decide where to invest. So for example, if France did not have a DTA with Ghana, you'll be paying 20% withholding tax instead of what? 10% when making a payment to France with respect to management or technical service fees. So for now, let's let's pause here and um, we'll continue in our next, our next video. We'll look at a lot more details when it comes to international taxation. So if you love this video, don't forget to smash the like button and don't forget to share this video within your entire network. I'll catch you in the next video. Thank you.